Hey, y'all. This is Geo special truck stop mixtape. Something new called Cine Bodega. Trying out this thing. Just want to talk to some filmmakers and uh, show their work. How you feeling? You feeling good? It's almost the end of the year. It feels great. It kind of feels great already, I think. I'm very excited to uh, bring on this guest. I know from back in the day from the Rock and Espanol scene, he's uh, he's a staple in the Chicago Chicago Rock and Espanol scene with his band Descarga and uh, his filmmaking and uh, and illustrating efforts. This is El Señor Hector Ivan Garcia. Brother, <laughs> what's up, my man? What is up, man? It's been a minute since I've seen you. It's been a little while, huh? It's like uh, years, literally, since I see you in person out in uh, California. IA. And then here we are in virtual land. I want to say it could be like, what year was it? Was it 2011, maybe? 11. Wow, man. Uh, yeah, wow. it's been a while. <laughs> How you been? Good. You know, like, uh, as good as can be under, uh, uh, considering all things, right? Um, trying to stay above water, trying to keep uh kind of swimming against the current but still swimming that's good still swimming floating yeah floating. Yeah. yeah we'll take it we'll take it <laughs> um i'm i'm glad to have you here man uh excited to talk about this project of yours uh you uh put together this documentary short hecho in chicago la historia de eduardo calvillo dj resisto 5,000. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we get into that, why don't we uh, tell people um, a little bit about your history, your backstory, and and uh, in the scene in Chicago and, and how you came up? Sure. Um, coming up in Chicago, uh, born and raised uh, on the south side of the city, uh, in the back of the yard neighborhood, uh, for those keeping score at home. Uh, but then transplant over to Brighton Park neighborhood. Ooh, um, moving on up, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> people in Chicago are like, Bleh. but um, never mind all that. Um, no, but yeah, you know, coming up as a city guy and uh, hanging out here, uh, uh, finding our way through uh, our identity, right? As arriving in uh, in the new neighborhood and trying to find your voice amongst the um, homogeneous environment is kind of tough because, you know, uh, the, the, the live the American dream and assimilation uh, idea was in full throttle, right? So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to try and uh, <clears throat> fit in as best you, you gotta can. You got to fit in, you got to fit in. Your parents be like, hey. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, being encouraged by parents, right, to uh, to assimilate because it's what would be successful. But, um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I was uh, in music early, like at, like four and five years old. Uh, my dad had me doing mariachis uh, music out there uh, and, you know, being a, a singer, like, you know, learning all the little Pedrito Fernandez songs and... <laughs> So and you, go, had, you had the La Mochila Azul down. Dude, dude. Mochila Azul. <laughs> I did Trente, you know, some Juanga songs. Um, and, uh, yeah, so being out there, uh, you know, and performing, uh, yeah, since an early age. But, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't return back into, like, music and doing stuff until, like, uh, high school when, you know, uh, rock and espanol is like starting to become a thing, right? And I'm like, what the hell's going on? Like, what, who? Uh, there's music, uh, rock and roll coming out of Latin America, like what? So this is my like, you know, senior year in high school where I'm just tuning in, albeit um, they've already existed before. I didn't discover it, not Columbusing anything here, um, but but it was new to me. And um, when, once you start navigating. Uh, in those waters of like, whoa, I love the beats. I love the music. I love the vibe. And in, it's in Spanish and I'm not being deterred from speaking Spanish anymore. Yeah. I'm actually encouraged. Uh, it becomes a, a big deal. It's uh, funny. It's funny how we, how we go back home, huh? Yeah. Just so we'd like, kind of like, mm -hmm. it just keeps pulling us back. You know, I, yeah. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't lie and say that, uh, you know, the support is there. I mean, 
initially because you know it's like rock and roll and you know it's like long hair greñudos it's the same idea for like parents they oh god where's my kid getting himself into you no know la universidad. ¿Qué pasó? you were on rock you were on such a good route you know? um and then and then rock and roll hit right uh but i mean i had always like liked rock um you know you see pictures of me in seventh and eighth grade you know rocking the mullet which is almost kind of making a comeback i don't even know what's going with this covid hair uh style but um yeah so like i had i was into like that hair metal band of the 80s poison guns and roses you know when everybody else was pretty much not not in my old neighborhood you know i was kind of stuck out like a sore thumb but <laughs> It's like, hey guys, let's rock. And everyone's like, oh, hey, come on, Hector. Hey, I will say <laughs> that I, myself and my group of friends, that we won uh, the lip sync con contest in eighth grade, came in first doing uh, Talk Dirty to Me by Poison. So, oh my God. So, uh, we, I, I did, I did one year in high school <laughs> for the high school uh, talent show with some friends, my buddy Brian Springer, Todd Snow. Bill, uh, we did. Uh, your mama don't dance. Boom! <laughs> Dropping. The, wait, the poison version or uh... we did the poison version. Oh, okay. Of course, it was it was eighty eight. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it was something to to <clears throat> sink your teeth into uh, at the time, and uh, you know, with with friends and like, all right, let's do it. Let's go and jumping off the stage uh into like an audience that's <clears throat> excuse me following along watching a lip sync content and here you are jumping off the stage uh okay guys you win uh, but yeah you know the the musical influence i mean chicago's just i mean everybody knows the the i don't know what it is about the chicago music scene and everybody will say that they have their own version of it, right? Like, oh, well, my, my, our, our town has an awesome music scene. But I mean, just thinking about it historically, you know, from, uh, from blues, you know, uh, it, we had our own jazz, right? Mm -hmm. We have house music coming out of here. We got great hip hop Crazy. artists. I mean, um, and, and to me, um, rock in Espanol, like once, once I, uh, understand that it's a thing it's a legit thing right and then, oh we could do that too um i always saw it like that like it's like this is something that can literally like and it's not that it's uh it can only happen in chicago but chicago because it is a hub of humanity yeah yeah. you know people a, came here for opportunity it's a big melting pot a lot of a yeah. lot of different mucha raza mucha gente de, de toda parte and yeah. uh i mean the jobs met, were here and that, that's yeah. what it was. It attracted the people because of the opportunities and jobs. And then when you're not working and busting your hump, they say, what do you do? Well, well I like to relax. Toco la guitarra. You know, I, uh, I, I play this or I get together with friends and we jam out. And it becomes something uh, like more, right? So it's like it's the rest of who you are, I think. And the fact that it's Chicago, that you do have people pull from everywhere. Um, our scene was just that and an amalgam of all of mexico and all of its parts central america south america uh friends from the caribbean it's like you only had the limited venues that were available to us right at the time i'm sure you guys experienced that on the east coast too um or west coast that you know you couldn't get the pick of the of the the, the, of the crop no venues, right? no so, and, and a lot of it too was just uh, I feel like misunderstanding as far as like what we expected, you know, sometimes it was like, it was like, well, you know, they'll never let us play there. And it's like, the more you, you, uh, the more we, we understood the business side, it, like really people don't care. They yeah. just want, can you, you, can you bring people in? Will people be buying drinks and stuff? It's like, yeah, have your show here. And, uh, that's when things started happening in LA too, where people were just like kind of stepping up and, and promoting these shows. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say real quick that I see hot eight, eight, eight says, hi guys. Hope y'all doing okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> doing great. I see hot. Yes. I hope that's not an ad, but yeah. um, what about um, this guy? I mean, was it like, that's your first solid band, right? Like you, you kind of hit that for a long time, right? 
I mean, yeah, this guy that came about um, in college when friends of mine are starting to get into the rock and espanol uh, scene that's developing, you know, and uh, you're starting to see uh, people your age, people that you see at the cafes and stuff, organizing their their uh, band, right? Organizing their ideas, getting them to the shows and performing them. You're like, whoa, buddies of mine. I'm like, hey man, like uh, they, we were in a student organization. At, we went to Columbia College at the time um, here in Chicago and it's like, oh, we're part of the student organization. We get, we need, they want us to put together a, a Cinco de Mayo bash or whatever. They're like, uh, who in the organization knows how to play an instrument? It literally became that. <laughs> and and then a couple of my friends and they got together. I play guitar, bass, drums, uh, vocalist, da da da. So they did this one-off show that we organized and we put it together. You know, we did it. It was a great times. But uh, that left that kind of like, hey, man, that, that was really cool. That needs to happen again. Um, so but they, they had a singer and everybody was hell bent on like uh, they would like the idea of like a, a vocalist or the female vocalist. Right. And obviously I didn't fit the bill. And uh, they're like, dude, uh, <laughs> not yet. Yeah, not yet. Like, thanks for hanging out with us. But, like, you know, you can't be part of our band. Just let's just put that out there. I'm like, come on, man. Uh, <laughs> And then I was all, you know, whatever, but my buddy from the band, he's like, look, why do you keep sweating us so hard? Go make your own damn band. And I'm like, uh, sure. So <laughs> that was it. It was like, hey, um, some other guys that were there hanging out too, just kind of de colado, you know, like uh, hanging out with the band and the, at the practices. And like, hey, do you play guitar? Yeah, right. So that's how I started connecting with other people. And uh, one thing led to another where just like guys that weren't in other projects and, uh, we started our band and uh, we uh, did that in 96. 96. Yeah, it's just about right. That's that's when Mapache started, man. Really? really? You and Mapache was in 96. Yeah. Um, and, and it was such a Chicago scene, man. It, for, for us coming from, from L.A., every opportunity that we, we could to go to Chicago, we did it. And it was always, we felt like rock stars. I mean the 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 support and how crazy intense the scene there was. I mean, we in LA it was pretty hot. I mean, at one point it was, you know, over a hundred rock and espanol bands, but um, but Chicago was definitely just this open arms to um, outside bands and and uh, and promoters and putting you know people putting shows together and radio too. I mean and and. Uh, the subject of your uh, documentary, Eduardo, um, he's definitely influential in that. Um, let me uh, ask you about your your filmmaking, tus raíces in uh, filmmaking. Like, how did you get started in that, and 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 how does E N E hop up? And tell me a little bit about that and what that means. Uh, yeah, so. <clears throat> In, in studying, like going to college, right? And uh, I was talking to a friend about this, about like like the luxury of going to college, right? It's like you have an opportunity to go to college uh, coming from a you know first generation uh, Latino family background. It's a pretty big thing, uh, only because it's it's uh, an opportunity that not everybody prior to your existence in your family had, right? So yeah, uh, yeah going to college. Uh, Studying film was just I, the logical progression of enjoying the whole movie. Ay, mijo, ¿por qué no has abogado o algo? Yeah, no. Well, the, the thing was that, you know, and that was on a fluke. It was like one of my, I was in high school and there happened to be a college fair, right? And um, in the gym at the, at the high school and I'm like, da, 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 da. I see the usuals, you know, all these big universities and stuff, you know, trying to. Uh, attract uh, students to go and offering up their, their course study. And I'm like, uh, I saw one, it was like an art school, right? So I was like, hey, do you guys, uh, I, I see it says film and it's like, uh, it's like, I need Latinos go there, like any Mexicans show up, right? <laughs> like, oh yeah, come down. Like, I'm in a, the student organization and they support it very well. We sign up here, scholarship possibilities, la la la. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. And so yeah, my entrance exam or the little, the sheet, right? To kind of like, 
bio on you and what you've done, your accomplishments. I'm like, yeah, I like, you know, uh, thinking that my prior to that point, all my film experience was my buddy who had a VC, you know, VHS cam. We'd make home movies, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, they were all out there. Uh, Batman and Young Guns <laughs> Three that never Young made Guns it. Three. Young Guns Three never made it to the big screen, right? And never made it to the theaters. But um, <laughs> and you know, so they were. I, but those are to me achievements, right? So I write on there. Uh, yeah, yo, I've been part of this production and this production, and, and <laughs> it didn't dawn on me until later that that's that was not. Uh, those are not actual <laughs> like legitimate productions, no, but no real it credits. got me uh, through the door. And no, I, but I was able to be part of a program like there that they were like, in, you know, taking in year one discovery, I think it was called, like to introduce you to the college life and get a job on campus and the difference that it would be from being in high school, right? So, um, yeah, the school is really awesome. Uh, I don't regret anything about having gone there. Like, you know, people always say, oh, you can learn it from videos or books or what have you. And I'm not trying to be like elitist or anything, but being there in an environment with other passionate filmmakers, uh, all trying to tell their stories of like they're either they're the stories of their lives, the story of their background, the story of their history uh, and being passionate and moving forward. Um, and then just sharing that experience with them. So like I never I, I'm like it was worth it all. Like I love the experience um you know then afterwards where it's like all right and now you're on your own and fly <laughs> it's like that was the tough part right uh but we'll get into that later but all the information that that i acquired there and learned and as the technology changed like i learned how to you know cut film literally splicing film pieces together with tape and then yes. you know if that was the experience you had Having on your strips and yeah. getting pieces and so, you know, I was dealing with physical 60 millimeter film and, you know, developing it and you had to get your lighting just right. Cause it what, got the, what cameras did you guys use in your school? Uh, we had Bolexes. The Bolex is the classic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and that was, that was that, like you did it, you learned it the hard way, but as I was there, the technology was advancing. So I did take, I was able to take some courses of like video editing, ooh, a non-linear editing software, you know, like. <laughs> It was like the future, right? Like, what? You mean you don't have to touch it? Yeah, it's all digital. We're all like, oh, wow. So, so yeah, it became, uh, that was at the tail end. And, and then you realize, all right, um, maybe I can't get to Hollywood, but I can pick up a nice little, like, Canon XL1 or something. Like, invest in some some uh, equipment that yeah, I can do here. Equipment. And and so that's where e, &E starts, uh, the original show. I think it was around like 2000 ish uh where um so the rock and espanol scene is like starting to cook right like bands um like i said i wasn't even like the first wave i was probably like the second wave of bands that started um performing around town but then by that time it was like already like okay but the venues are established right we got a couple of restaurants that will allow us to play here uh some little ca some cafes that have agreed to it some bars that are not checking id you know like <laughs> yeah yeah all of these little setups so it's like this little network where bands are able to play and and perform at so i'm just like you know what man this this bites uh because when you start looking at like well, what are we doing differently than than the rest of either the professional world or just even other bands and see like what is it that that work because you don't really like see it <clears throat> that way like i knew what kind of what was happening in a cultural way to me and my expression uh through the band and through the art of music that i was able to descargar which is where the uh the name comes from but you also start realizing that uh it's uh, it's a whole new it's all by itself it's like a bubble right like that that right outside like literally you know we're playing doing a gig it's a packed place not that it holds a bazillion people but like the people that are there are rocking yeah, no, there's, people there's outside body and surfing you know yeah. it's like uh it, it's bonkers but right outside like 26 three little village i mean people you know gang members are shooting each other literally yet in here we were might as well have been in a parallel universe. Like yeah. nothing was going to affect us in here. The vibe was all the people that were in there and the energy was there. And the cool thing about, about that was that 
you know, you had rockeros, you had metaleros, you had uh, guys that were into, uh, you know, ska and, and urbano music. Uh, urbano, yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. Urbano now takes the form of like uh, metal like, a little bit. Well, I hear like it referred like urbano like reggaeton and like that's like I, I oh, don't know. Yeah, 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 no, but who refers to say rock urbano. Yeah, but when it's rock urbano, you got like rock and roll, that you got three, you know, and that kind of vibe. Yeah, at least that's what it was like considered over here. So, um, yeah, you had all these cats who probably wouldn't even like think twice about hanging out with each other outside of the venue but now we're sharing a space now we're sharing a stage uh now our now our you know groups and and our people that follow each band are now mingling right so it's like yeah it's it basically this is bigger than us way bigger it became yeah. i like like my spanish is by far uh, where i would love for it to be uh considering the late start i had when it was beaten out of me early in life but um you know, now I'm like, whoa, I'm learning more Spanish from, you know, different areas of the world because I'm throwing in like Chilango kind of like slang, mixing it in with Puerto Rican, uh, like, you know, ban I'm like, what? I never heard of ban What is that? Like, okay, but I'm starting to now use it and understand it. And it's becoming part of my lingo as a person because I'm just absorbing it all because everything is so cool and new, right? And the the reality is, like I said, it's all happening in this kind of like encapsulated uh, this uh, this like bubble that the rest of the world wasn't even aware of. So when I'm thinking, hey man, how do we get like how do we break out to the next level? Like what what do these guys got that we don't got? And it's like, oh, they don't we don't got media coverage. <laughs> Nobody's covering us. Nobody's talking about us. Nobody's writing no, about no us. Press, no, There's no, nothing. No videos, so it's like, no TV, no nothing. You don't, you can exist in this bubble forever. It was very comfortable and cozy and you love it. And you walk into the room and everybody's high-fiving you like you're a rock star, right? <laughs> but it really is that room. And and what we, I think, ventured and, and everything band, it's like you really want to share your music with the world, right? As many people yeah, as yeah. possible. So whether you say I'm content with who's in the room, it's like, no, you, you make your music to reach. For the like, world. For if the world. you could reach the world, you would. Right. Yeah. Um, the thing is that it's, it's all very controlled by uh, the media and their outlets. So I'm like, we got to make our own. It's all DIY. And I go, I got the, I got the knowledge. I got the background in it. I had invested in a camera for my own productions. I'm like, you know what? Let's just do this. Let's, let's go. Let's, let's create a show and, you know, create make it episodic you know like we couldn't we didn't have enough like uh crew and person power to to create like daily like weekly episodes where we could kick them out like that because it was just like shoot it we'll see what we got kind of mm -hmm. do some interviews with bands like and and they i mean if you've ever if you ever get to see uh, like the early shows they're like you know horrible <laughs> audio it's totally in the red <laughs> because we're right next to the speaker <laughs> I, I didn't even know how to use the gear that well, uh, to be honest with you. So, but, but we but, kept. But, but you were doing it. But you were doing it. So and they do. they'd like, see with the, yeah, they'd see us out there with the camera, and they knew that we were the ones like, you know, shoving a camera in people's faces and putting a light on when we figured out that lighting was important. You know, uh, <laughs> with all my background, you'd figure I would have figured that out a lot sooner. <laughs> but yeah, there was a bunch of those episodes in the beginning where I was like. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and what wow. is what does E N E stand for? So that was like the idea was, you know, <laughs> for I as think much, we're talking about it right now. <laughs> yeah, for as much as uh, you know, the I think the the whole vibe of it was, in my opinion, very like punk rock. Yet punk rock was not really part of it. I mean, they were because the punk rock like they had their own scene. I can't even touch it. They already had their network. They were touring. You know, like uh, bands like Los Crudos were had already gone to Japan. Yeah. You know, while we're over here playing in a restaurant, you know, uh, that allowed us to play. So it's like, um, I can't take away nothing from the punk scene because that was all like their th that uh, 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 its own thing, right? Its own network. But I will say that you know, with us uh, having that and covering us and doing our our, our own thing. We really like, 
kind of like push forward to to just get it out there and and to have something that was like ours and unique but that but like again it, it has to be diy the idea is do it yourself right so it's like and since the, the the whole show is riddled with errors we're like you know what man let's make it raw right like we had the punk vibe and attitude we just weren't literally playing punk <laughs> uh so yeah it, it was like you know uh errores no eliminados we're gonna like, leave all the errors all the f-ups leave you all know, there was all sorts of like outtakes throughout the show and like just horrible editing uh but that was the the appeal of it right it's like it's just us with cameras in our hand doing it uh, for other people that were interested and we got viewership people started tuning in and liking what we were doing and requesting more and 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 hey, how can i be a part of it how can i either be in front of the camera or how can i be behind the camera we got a lot of volunteers that came out and 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 mind you that was we did that that show was out i don't know maybe like uh on and off like throughout that one year right like so it's like a show here we do a lot of repeats because it's like man to kick it out isn't it it's a lot of work. It's it a lot is. Of work. I mean, I'm not. It's nothing new to you. You you were on LA TV, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, kicking out those shows, but you guys had like, you know, you're out there on another level, like, you know, like cabrones, deadlines, but, yeah. and all that shit, right? <laughs> but I, but I, but I completely understand of like just from working on other shows and doing and and specifically doing your own thing when you're doing your own thing, and you're kind of rallying people, and it's really you're working for the project for the art it's not like okay guys we're going to work and we're getting paid and all this yeah. like no it's like this we're doing this because we love this and you know and i i totally i totally understand i that. mean uh, to say that it's a passion project um you know is an understatement just because yeah. <laughs> it was our lives we it was, were, that's like, what we did it's just what we did we didn't like you know everybody had their day job don't get me wrong like everybody you know still punches in and out and does no, that. I, I got a late shift tonight i can't show yeah. you, know? you know what i mean the, the reality is like now nah, you're gonna be there why because i know you're here every friday at the dental college <laughs> like you know hold the light <laughs> yeah exactly right yeah. like you make yourself useful man like fucking be part of it. like hold don't let these food bump into me while i'm trying to record you know, use security do something <laughs> So like, yeah, a lot of people would help out and got excited about it. Um, but we were like, again, we weren't like an organized an organization per se, but we, we organized ourselves enough to do that. So that, that show kind of like rattled apart um, just from, you know, naivete and uh, being uh, freshmen in production of television. But, but then we came back. Uh, well, what we did in the meantime was really boost the and truth at the website, which was uh, we went from errores no eliminados, like the TV show, sporadic. And then we're like, you know, what? we need something consistent to do. And on their YouTube, started kicking out their little like widget or whatever, um, mm -hmm. their little window. So our our website for Intuva, they had that YouTube kind of channel built into it. And so we just pump everything on YouTube. Any interviews and artists that with artists that we were doing would go straight there. So um, yeah, you know. and and. Uh... I have to give a shout out to Sandra. Oh yeah, um, Sandra, just one of the cool people, also from Chicago, always mm -hmm. supporting the the bands and and new artists and and uh, doing radio stuff, part of the scene. Um, so during this time, you're you're uh, collecting this footage, you're going to shows, doing interviews. How did you come about with the idea of uh, doing something on Eduardo? So th with the show uh, that we had um, that just, you know, it was doing it weekly with, with friends and again, nobody getting paid. It was all independent yet. We still had the urge to kind of put out the, um, the scene for whatever it is, you know, uh, it's what we had and it was our content, but that show in, in essence breaks open to general market because other people start seeing it they're like hey man i like your show you got a three camera setup you shoot on a sunday and it's up by uh wednesday so people um that wanted to promote their upcoming weekend show could actually use us in a in a more strategic way because yeah. that was my problem with the first show it's like we can't interview somebody and be like uh they have a show coming up. It's like, you know, you can't little... plug it. Yeah. So, and, and, and it's like, that's where the deficit was again. Like, what do they have that we don't have? Well, general market has uh, talk shows 
that, that they promote. Hey, come check it out this weekend opening up, you know, the, the films releasing or or this weekend will be at the fill in the blank performing. Come check us out. Right. So you're using it as a promotional tool and the people couldn't do that. But we were offering that. Uh, to the local scene so hey come check me out this weekend it's like oh hell yeah i just saw you guys do three songs on this show uh and then get interviewed and tell us about your music it's like, I, I dig it i'm gonna go see you so general market saw uh, value in that and and then started so we kind of like ran through all of the 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 rock and espanol bands or anybody that was in the genre in like i think the first two months everybody <laughs> that that wanted to and that wanted to participate had already like gone because we do like three bands uh you know back to back to back to back to and we just kept uh pumping it out there so eventually we're like yeah you know let us know when you've got an upcoming cd or whatever so it became more of a of a pace it, it fed itself it was feeding itself people and and, right. and, uh, and and so like it went to general market and it's like well that always like to me was like wow you know like we at that point i didn't value the show as much as i do now retrospectively um where ain't that, ain't that the thing yeah that's just the thing <laughs> um and you know quite frankly uh, that was a great tool for, and I think bands also like, oh shit, man, we could have been using that a lot differently, right? Yeah. Um, but the technology had just been starting out. We couldn't really, um, you know, and we weren't airing them on YouTube. Like it wasn't like this general where people like the, it was a uh, Chicago channel, uh, channel 25, a municipal channel. So people could see it, but the reality is like, hey man, it, we're, we're using these mu these musical backgrounds, uh, you know, for transitions and X, Y, and Z, we tried to put up one on YouTube and like, dang, dang, red, you know, boom, <laughs> licensing, copyright, dad, like clamping down. It's like, whoa, you know, uh, that's not going to fly, right? So it's like the reality is, yeah, there's probably still like a whole library of those shows that will never, you know, after they aired, they were never saw again by anybody. But we always would tell people, hey, record it. You got a VCR. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so I had one of those guys. DVR, DVR. Yeah, no, back then it was VCR, bro. VCR. You know, so but <laughs> program it. Yeah. So the, the the evolution of that is like as a band. Okay, well you're gonna go through. We got some coverage, and people, you know, did their write ups. People were Latinos were coming up, doing their thing. We got some friends, and they made it all the way to you know, write for the Reader or the Illinois Entertainer, uh, Tribune. Uh, covered you know some of the events uh got some headlines in sun times the big you know papers out here um but but that's it it's like you know we start thinking it's like what what other what other thing are we not doing right and it's like well you go from smaller shows to bigger shows and as as bands are progressing um so are the organizers and promoters um the, the other component being radio right like are we getting radio play so um that's where the idea to to cover eduardo came from which was um how do we cover like if we're gonna tell a story uh you know you gotta the story so why i mean we're already what at minute 33 and barely scratched the surface of of <laughs> chicago Rock and, Espanol, and that's pretty much the dilemma that's what happens when you're doing a documentary it's like can you squeeze in everything into this one, you know, piece? And quite frankly, even when you have a big budget like Netflix, you still have a six parter, right? That doesn't yeah. and, and people are still like, you didn't even cover a fraction. So and of so, what you should, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. You, you forgot this, and this is the most, and it's and it's difficult. It's it's yeah. difficult, and and uh, I'm glad that you brought that up because everyone's talking about. Uh, Romban Todo on Netflix, the the documentary about uh, rock in Latin in Latino America, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the it's definitely stirred up a lot of conversation and discussion and and uh, and I, but the the good thing this is the best part the good thing is that overall people are saying that it's good that it's that yeah. it's well made and it's actually you know that it. That is that it's great that something that some sort of document at this level exists, yeah. you know. And then now it's just like, okay, what was left out? Let's digest it, right? So it's yeah, like let's, let's, the keep digging, let's keep digging. The production value, spot on. I mean, it's Netflix, right? They got the money that they want to put. If they're gonna put out stuff, it's gonna be legit looking, right? And then so 
they're, they're putting it out there. They also got the dist- they have they are Netflix, so they are able to reach a bunch of people, right? So you get back to the fact that it made it like to Netflix, right? Because that's some kind of a mark, right? For people to be like, whoa, this is rad. Like we like when we were a band in bands, it's like, oh, I can't wait to get to MTV, right? Like yeah. I want my video on MTV. <laughs> like that is like the goal. Yeah, and, yeah, that's um, right. Un- like until- as the as, as, uh, as uh, Latino slant says, Pauli and Latino slant says, uh, a lot was left out, and it's like, yeah, I mean, it's like you can't, we can't fit the whole all the history of, in in six hours, um, but now I feel like it's just now people can get to specifics, you know, and even those the same producers who made that show can can dive in in different regions and and go, okay, you know what, we're gonna focus one season on just. Yeah. Mexican rock or art, you know, rock from Argentina or rock from the U S or whatever. And, uh, and they can go in depth. And and I feel like the stuff that you did with any and, and, uh, or any and, uh, and, and Chufa, the, the, all those things that you documented and all those, all those Friday and Saturday nights that you, you, uh, you just was just hanging out with a camera and some friends and a, and a, and a busted light and just taking all these interviews um, there's a lot of stuff there, man. I mean, and, and I just, uh, for me, it's like uh, the reason I wanted to even have you on the show besides being a cool old school friend, uh, was that you put this together and, and also that it's focused on just Eduardo, which is, I think good and specific because I feel like it's kind of hard. It's like, if you were to do a movie on the Chicago scene, you got a lot of work ahead of you. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and, and uh, it's good to kind of just zero in on a subject. And, uh, and, uh, and Eduardo Calvillo was just like, he's, he, he's a maker <laughs> and he made things happen. No, I mean, like him or not like him, right. There's a lot of, you know, public opinion, um, which is fine. Um, just good because that's how you know that somebody's doing something. Like, I feel like if, if anybody's doing something, that's worthwhile or that's, that's, that's on the edge or making things happen. There's going to be controversy. There's going to be people against her. There's going to be people who think they can do it better. Right. Yeah. Which it's, is fine. <laughs> I'm like, you want to like, do it. That's fine. I don't have a problem. There's been so many people. Oh, I should have been this should have been that. Look, the, the opportunity is there to do it. Like this was done on a micro budget. It's like, um, we were uh, we were fortunate enough to actually have a grant uh, from the city. Um, you know, they threw some, they they put money out there for artists to actually tell their stories in whatever medium, and uh, we organized ourselves, put in all the paperwork, da, 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 submit it, and the city's like, yeah, we want to hear something about what you're talking about, right? But when the idea is to okay, we want to talk about rock and español, but there's no way we have. I don't know how long it t- took them to shoot that documentary on netflix but any documentary is gonna take time right to um and i like that in the in the film i like tooting my own horn here but where uh it for those that haven't seen it eduardo says it's like yeah when i agree to you know work on on creating the like the festival it's um you have it doesn't happen overnight right it's like it's like although as much as people can critique in a heartbeat you can't produce in a heartbeat like nothing happens like that. Anything worth, you know, creating is you take your time and you build it and it happens. Um, this, this documentary was, uh, is, is that right? It's like, it's, it's something that is out there yet. It's not intangible anymore. You can critique it. And now it exists. Like it got pulled out of every person that's ever told me, Oh, let's like even invited me. Hey man, let, let, well, it, in essence, telling me, hey, um, why don't you shoot this idea? <laughs> I'm like, dude, like the idea isn't not there. It's just like, you have to be realistic. It's like, can the idea get done? Yeah. And you set, and then you set your goal. And then you set up your like, you know, deadlines. And like, it's all a process. Nothing happens on just a whim because you decided, right? So uh, in, with this documentary, I'm like, look, we, we can't cover it all. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be, um, saying uh x y or z or you miss this and so like i go let's just do this it'll be it's it's made in chicago and we're almost we're, we're setting it up in essence as a series this chapter you know is the eduardo calvillo story fine yeah did, did you like it great 
would you like to see more awesome okay here's how you can be part of it this is where you donate <laughs> this is where you send <laughs> you know your your work and labor and and understand that it is a big old process and to be done independently even when we had like i said um partial funding from the city to produce it uh, a lot of it is the the currency is time right it's, that's that's the main currency that's the main currency i want to say something real quick here yeah. um latino slant again uh, as long as you have the same people as the gatekeepers, you're going to have communities ignored. And congrats, Hector, on all you've done. Um, so congrats, Hector. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, it's, I agree it's, with them on the gatekeeper thing. It's, yeah, it's different. I mean, it's like to me, it's just like the gatekeepers are usually the co people connected to the corporations who are producing the things, you know. So it's like whether it's, you know, streamers, uh, uh, networks, or or press you know uh, uh a chain of magazines or newspapers or whatever it is um the same people seem to be always connected to that and and that's fine i, I personally feel like right now we're everything is just more reachable you know mm -hmm. we're, we're more attainable yeah. and that the gatekeepers do um you know they they uh they keep the gate yeah. but we just need to kind of create other uh, our own gates. <laughs> I mean, <there's, laughs> keep, we don't have to go through the gate. We can go we can jump it, the around fence. it, over it. We're pretty resourceful, man, as, as Latinos and, and being independent. Again, I, nobody, I, I, I mean, where? I don't know who's coming from generational wealth that you know of that's producing <laughs> these kind of things. But the reality is it's like you're you're making it with the tools that are accessible to you, with, with the motivation and, and the know-how that you can put in. And this is exactly that. Like the dude, where, well, I'm sorry, I forgot the name, but um, it's the tuning in to this, we're creating something. This becomes the next thing. I don't take nothing away from Netflix. I'm like, dude, y'all started yeah. out with CDs, getting mailed to people's houses, and then a little box at Jewel or whatever the grocery store is by you guys. Um, and, then, and then the thing moved on to streaming other people's stuff. And now like a my understanding is the majority of their content that they stream is their own productions. Yeah. So it's like they produced this, but they were the ones who created the distribution in essence. So they laid down the tracks and then they sent stuff down the pipe. And yeah, I will they're, say they're, they're, they're not the gatekeepers. They're the gate. They created the whole system. <laughs> like their Netflix distribution uh, reach. Uh, they are the whole octopus, right? <laughs> um, but that's not to say that there's no room for other squids definitely no and other there's fish in the room. sea, right? Yeah, there's definitely room. I mean, and, and and here's the bottom line, is that people want to see it. People want to know more about it, and that's a good thing. That's a good yeah. thing. I think that, I think there, there'll, there will be opportunities for for these other stories and other communities to be, to have their, their stories told at that same level. Yeah. And at the same time, there'll be other, like you said, other workarounds, other other ways and other avenues that because of, say, the attention given to something like Rompantodo, that other things, you know, Netflix isn't the only streamer out there. Yeah. You know, there's other streamers, other, you know, whatever. And it's like, and there are other things. We have YouTube, like right now, like for example, you're short. It's in Chicago. Um, where can people go see it? Um, so that's on YouTube as well. Uh, it's very accessible. We, we chose to just put it out there, like, uh, free to the public. Um, the film was produced uh, in 2019. Uh, so we actually, and, and this is why, um, you know, I'm not pandering to Netflix because hopefully one day they'll let me do something for them uh, that's far from it. But what I will say is that, that they created, like, they dropped the, some pebble, right? Boom. Now yeah. these waves are coming out. This interview is coming out as a result. I mean, I mean, I love talking to you, but I don't know if you'd, we would be on camera talking about anything it, unless there was a reason to, right? And we're reacting to yeah. it. And then here we are uh, creating, uh, saying, hey, look, we had a similar thing, but it wasn't exactly that. Here's a, a, a sliver of, of what's happened in Chicago over the years. Um, and following the, the, the story of this one DJ, right, who was kind of like um, the who helped me 
I, I learned a lot of those bands that are on there on his show, like, cause he's either playing them, talking about them on his show or, or bring help bringing them in as an event organizer. Mm-hmm. So to me, I like, I, I see that as like, that's valuable. You may not see the value in it necessarily because yeah, they might be like, oh, well, you know, he's a gatekeeper himself. He would only put on whatever he wanted. And he's like, you know, it was his show and his personality. You either got along with him or you didn't. But at the end of the day, uh, that exists. And then other shows are also happening around him. He wasn't the only caterer in town and doesn't even pretend to be. Um, but what he will say is that you can't take away any of those achievements. No, and no. quite frankly, like, uh, you go, hey, I see you. I, I identify and, and recognize what you're doing. Um, and that's awesome because now either we like it and want to follow what you're doing or we're going to create our own and go somewhere else. And, and there's other radio shows out there. People do podcasts. You know, uh, there's um, people that, you know, create other events. Uh, the, the list goes on and on uh, how you can be inspired or, you know, uh, just just because you don't like something be inspired but <clears throat> in that i'm going to be like okay cool i'm i'm i can appreciate it even on that level but that's just me a lot of people don't kind of see the big thing and and netflix was that like yeah you know you're seeing it through the eyes of the, of of that lens right and a lot of people are like man well he missed a bunch of stuff and granted growing up in you know in in p- public schools here you get taught out of the textbook and, you know, Latin American history, is a, you know, or like, you know, they, they teach you the narrative that you want to, that, that, that is, that is pumped out. Yeah. And, 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 and for everyone to follow, right. Until, you know, you get to college. You get and, or, well, it's getting younger and younger. I will say that young people are now starting to be like, nah, I think Christopher Columbus, ain't, you know, like they're, they're starting to, to, to fight back on those narratives that they're being taught and, and people are still hanging on to, but you know, uh, because now we're in the information age, so information is very accessible. Uh, but the reality is, is like creating, <clears throat> they do have a responsibility and that I won't take away from them. And then they put it out there. So uh, the responsibility of telling, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't, how can I put this? They put it out there, we react, we check them. And then when they check, it's like not that we need an apology, but it's mm-hmm. like, hey man, I, I recognize that that we're not as gullible or as dumb as you think we are, and we're just gonna take it at face value. I mean, I, I kind of like the odd comparison, but look at the the Sonic movie, right? Uh, Sonic people they they pump out these images. And Sonic looks like horrendous with teeth and yeah. looks all crazy. Does not look at all like human teeth. What? It, what's happening there, right? And then the, so the people are like, "Nope, we are not going to take that." So yeah. they went back, they redid it, and then kicked it out. So it's like it's it's a relationship with the gatekeepers, if you want to call them that, that is now starting to shift, right? Like there's some weight to public opinion if you yeah, don't yeah. like it. And, and I think and I think that 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 hopefully what. My my hope with all that is that is that there will be more, that and there will what, be more, and, and that's then, what you're left with, yeah. Yeah, um, I want to do two things before we mm-hmm. cut off. Um, one thing we're gonna be able we're gonna show the short right now, and okay. and uh, I'm gonna run the link, so I want you to send me that as soon as you can. Okay. Um, but also, I wanted to talk real quick uh, about your. Um, illustrating. Okay. You know, what's, what's that all about? I mean, cause I know that's a part of the filmmaking and yeah. I see something in the background. Yeah. <laughs> up there. Um, so illustration. Um, so, I mean, much like yourself, I think I, my brain is like ahead of reality <laughs> in a bunch <laughs> of different ways. Um, that if I could split myself up into a bazillion people, I would dedicate myself solely to, uh, certain things and, and, um, but I can't, I'm just me. So I have to be like one thing at a time. I have to slow myself down. Um, and, and and part of that is the, uh, like the illustrator, right? So it's like, I got into illustrations late. Um, I was probably like in my late thirties. Um, when I started to, because I work for, uh, my day job is working at, at the schools, right? I work for Chicago Public Schools and I, I, I work uh, one-on-one with kids. Uh, so being in their classes, 
Um, and then just like, see, they're being taught geometry, right? So I, I developed these characters that um, I started uh, creating little comics for the kids. I'm like, hey, and they had like the room library. So uh, I would finish a comic, laminate it, uh, and they put it and they're like, um, oh, actually on my share day, because everybody had a share day, uh, I would share my comic and they would like it. They're like, yeah, put it in the library. I'm like, all right, great. I'll leave it there. I got up a couple of uh, installments and it became a thing where uh, these characters, um, the polygons, um, are these shape-shifting horror heroes. Uh, all of them are like, you know, classic horror hero, uh, horror characters, you know, the Dracula character, the Frankenstein character, Wolfman, and so forth. Um, but they shapeshift, right? They have a, a little shape uh, that they all are, a polygon that they have. And um, that's how they get their powers and they derive their powers from there. Um, but within that, I was like, oh, cool. I can squeeze in some diversity, right? Uh, and tell different stories. Uh, social emotional learning got put into them. And um <clears throat> But, but that was all like from like the kids telling me, hey, bring out the next chapter, bring out the next. So I developed the whole uh, like the the little series, and um, and then yeah, it's just like that's always been a a, a part of me uh, to to like tell stories, right? But what's the medium? I don't know. You can, you know you can only dedicate yourself to one at a time. I can't uh, split my brain not at this level. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so but I mean, I got as far as like getting some merch out, and you know, like, merch, merch. so it's called Polygons. Yeah, the the Polygons, um, and 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 actually, I do see later in this year uh, kicking out. Uh, like, uh, I might actually uh, do a collab with another super talented artist friend of mine. Um, who I talked to her, and you know, like you know, talking about DIY and like punk vibe. Um, we're going to do, instead of a split, you know, 45, we'll do a split, uh, comic, right? So flip it. <laughs> yeah. So that we can have, you know, like, Hey, because you know, the overhead and production costs is like, Hey man, we can split it. And then like, again, back to also like the bands, like my people that like my stuff might like yours, people that like yours might like mine. So it's like, you got to keep throwing, uh, the energy yeah, back and forth. Together. Yeah. You can't really hang on to nothing. That's what I'm starting to realize more and more. Maybe it's just the gray hair is talking, but um, we're just here for a little while, man. Nothing, like, nothing is precious. Nothing, I mean, you, know, you got something, it's like the coolest thing you could do is share it or give it, you know, like to somebody. And it's like, um, because not to be like at some point you just can't hold everything. So just let it go. Let it flow through you. More stuff's coming. Believe me. <laughs> it's right there. You gotta keep letting it flow. But, um, uh, I don't know if you, uh, was this i'm like was there a question <laughs> no no no, no. I, just, I, just, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that man because I, I know that uh, oh yeah I've yeah seen, so the the work. yeah dot com and and right so, now so it's the polygons.com yeah if anybody wants to pop in there i took a stab <laughs> for at a while um actually a colleague of mine um from the schools uh wanted to uh, create a book of more social emotional learning um so she hired me as an illustrator um, so this was my first one of that. This is on Amazon, my loving world. Um, is that spelled right on the screen right now? If you could, do you see it on the uh, screen right here? Is it polygons? Oh, let me see the polygons. Yeah. Um, cool. So yeah, illustration is just something that comes up. Uh, I'm, I'm more of an, on a per project thing. Like what, what's, you know. Ahead. And where can, where can people find you online, man? Um, probably, is your contact info on the polygons page? Yeah, you can always go. Like the polygons is like I return to it because I'll always they'll always have a special place in my heart, right? Regardless of what I'm doing, so people can always reach me there. But um, yeah, look out for um, my handle on most uh, social media is El Gran Ivan. So you can find me um, there and uh, reach me. Reach out. Let's let's collab. I hear people say collab. Is that, which collab. Like, what is, is it? Collab or is it collab? Lab, uh, I'm gonna say collab, but yeah, hey. that's what I like, right? I mean, like, we're I'm old just, school, right? Yeah, let's collab, dude. But I guess mm -hmm. collab is the new one. What's up, real quick? Mm -hmm. uh, so there it is, a gran Ivan on all yeah. social platforms. So, Ivan, I mean, uh, Don Hector or el gran Ivan. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, man. We're going to give the people a little taste of this, but 
if you can't watch it now, please check out El Gran Ivan on Instagram or search him on YouTube or, or yeah. Facebook and and uh, and you'll find a link to this this really cool short doc uh, like, uh, hecho in Chicago, La Historia de, de Eduardo Calvillo, DJ Resistol 5000. Uh, thank you so much, man. Thank you so hey, much for thank- talking, brother. Thanks for having me, bro. Like, uh, definitely, it's it's great to see you again, and I, I love that you're doing this because pues, no te quedas atrás, bro. You're always hustling, bro. Like every project you do, I'm like, oh, this guy's at it again. Let's see, let's, let's go. Let's catch him on Twitch. Let's catch him on YouTube. And um, there's more to come. Like this little project I did. Uh, like again, this this thing hopefully it turns into a series. Um, but there's also like short narratives on the way. Um, we'll put those in the links as well as to where you can uh, look out for those. But yeah, production. I mean, we got to tell our stories, bro. And this yeah, is well, it. well, it's our time. The next right? thing that happens, you let me know. We'll do this again. Let's do it. All right, brother. Thank you so much, everybody. This is Echo in Mexico. I do Echo in, in Chicago. Con influencia de Mexico. Um, <laughs> and uh, La Historia de Eduardo Calvillo. Aquí va. Truck Stop Mixtape, Cine Bodega, Hector Iván Garcia. No, en ese tiempo no existía el reggaetón así como existe hoy entonces era así como que te gustaba la música regional mexicana o, o de repente había gente joven que escuchaba rock en español mi jefe siempre tenía tubo estéreos eh, que en ese tiempo decía la gente que eran de fayuca que alguien de Estados Unidos te llevaba un aparato bueno cuando mis hermanas invitaban a sus novios a mi casa, llegaban los novios con discos LPs bajo sus brazos para distraerme y poder accionar con mis hermanas, los malditos. Y mientras tanto yo escuchaba a los Beatles, a Led Zeppelin, Shaking Blue, me acuerdo mucho, Chicago. Mi primera experiencia con la música fue amenizar fiestas de mis amigos de la secundaria con un auto estéreo que conectaba un eliminador de baterías de 12 voltios y le robaba las bocinas a mi jefe y iba a las fiestas de casa y ponía mis cassettes, mis mixes de cassettes en un estéreo de carro. Yo soy originario de San Luis Potosí, orgullosamente potosina. San Luis Potosí es un estado que está en el centro del de país, la República Mexicana. Mediados de los noventas, terminé la carrera universitaria y muchos de mis compañeros de escuela, en un año nadie tenía trabajo. Una conocida mía, su mamá vivía aquí. De hecho, tenía así un vuelo de que llegabas tal día y te regresabas en 15. Y así como que fue una decisión de que está mejor acá, eh, está más bonita la ciudad, todo diferente. Y pues, a ver qué pasa, ¿no? Y si no, si no pasa nada, pues me regreso en un año, ¿no? Entonces ya nunca tomé el vuelo de regreso. Cuando llegué aquí empecé a escuchar más cosas mexicanas como Fobia, Caifanes, Maldita, La Castañeda, etc. Y tenía pues, una colección. En esos tiempos había algunas tiendas que empezaban a vender el material, como Discolandia, Ritmo Latino, no sé si te acuerdas. Entonces empecé así como a coleccionar eso y tenía un buen. Y amigos me decían, no, no mames, puedes poner una estación de radio con eso, ¿no? Un día iba de mi trabajo a un car wash y antes de meterme al car wash, en el radio estaba un comercial de una estación que estaba diciendo ¿Quieres tener tu propio programa de radio? Comunícate con Jay Stern al 847. Era un vendedor, o sea, un señor que se dedicaba a vender espacios de la radio, que en ese tiempo era 92.7 FM, The Bear, en Arlington Heights. Y me dijeron, búscate un patrocinador y, y el primer patrocinador que fui fue una taquería se llamaba Panchos Burritos, me acuerdo. Fui, el señor dijo, ¿cuánto? ¿Dónde firmo? Y así empecé. Me dijeron, ¿sabes usar la consola? Les dije, no. Me dijeron, ok, uh, hay un programa antes que el tuyo, que hacía un güey que se llamaba Hambone, que promovía la música de blues en Chicago. Entonces fui dos veces a verlo, cómo operaba la consola. Invité a dos amigos, a un argentino, a Flavio, 
y a otro compañero Tomás a que hicieran el programa. Yo solamente era el productor y ellos hablaban. Pero llegó un momento de que pues, no, era algo que estábamos haciendo por diversión y eh, estos dos chavos empezaron a sentir su... Hice por otro lado y me quedé solo. Afortunadamente la estación donde yo estaba tenía 2000 watts de potencia y la antena estaba así súper gigante, tipo la torre Eiffel en Arlington Heights y se escuchaba hasta, desde Winnetka hasta Pilsen, la villita. Y la gente que no vivía en Chicago, porque en ese tiempo Radio Arte tenía 200 watts de potencia y tenían la antena en la azotea de, un, de una casa de dos pisos. Entonces nada más se oía en la villita. Entonces muy, muy poca gente, latinos, jóvenes, que vivían en Elgin, Aurora, o sea, no sabían ni que existía Radio Arte. Entonces, cuando yo empiezo a hacer eso, pues, toda esa gente de Waquigan, de todos lados, qué buena onda, ¿no? House of Blues trajo a Fobia y el único referente que House of Blues tenía del rock en español era una estación de radio que estaba en Arlington Heights. Entonces ellos me llaman y me dicen que cuánto les cobro por ir a tocar de DJ. Entonces me pagan por pasar comerciales de show de Fobia y me invitan a ser el DJ de House of Blues. Y de repente House of Blues empieza a hacer 10 shows o 12 shows al año de rock en español. Y yo soy así como el resident, el DJ residente de House of Blues. Y así es como empiezo a hacer a, a tal punto que House of Blues me ofrece un contrato de hacer un show de bandas locales de Chicago una vez al mes. Y esa fue una iniciativa de Michael Jerky, que ahora es el jefe de presidente de Live Nation. Un saludo. O sea, una gente con visión que sabía que esta música tenía futuro y, y vio en mí así como él es el que está haciendo eso y así pasó. Al año y medio que yo empecé ahí a hacer el show, Superestrella de Los Ángeles compró toda la estación. Y entonces de esa estación me fui a otra, en Elgin, 94.3 FM. Ahí estuve otro año. ¿Cómo van las cosas con la radio? Con la radio, pues ahí estamos todavía luchando contra, contra marea. ¿Cuál es la contra situación la corriente, en este momento? ¿no? Contra la corriente. En estos momentos, eh, la estación en la que estábamos eh, fue vendida y nos pasaron, nos aventaron a todos a otra estación y ahorita no, no sé ni qué día ni qué hora, okay. o sea que estamos en el... En este momento no están transmitiendo. No. ¿Y, ¿Y les han dicho algo sobre de lo de hablar español todavía? O? No, ya, ya se resolvió ese problema. Había ser otra de las cosas que no nos... Querían que todo el programa fuera manejado totalmente en inglés, y, pero gracias a Dios y a las quejas de la gente, o sea, <risa> se va a hacer en español. Y de ahí escuché otro comercial parecido al de Jay Stern, pero era de la Universidad de Loyola, donde decían, uh, you want to have your own show, send your use demo, na, 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 na. Y I did. Esta es tu música y esta es tu frecuencia. Rock sin anestesia. Rock sin anestesia. Miércoles 10 de la noche a 2 de la mañana. Rock sin anestesia 88.7. Tuve que adaptarme igual que lo que hice en, uh, en The Bear 92.7, porque el programa que estaba anterior al mío era un programa de punk. Empezaba mi primera hora era poniendo punk latinoamericano. Cosas como, no sé, dos minutos, ataque 77, uh, hasta secta core de México, cosas así, para más o menos hacer una transición así suavezona. Es la misma música, pero cantada en diferente lenguaje. En esos tiempos, como todo era a base de revistas y de formatos físicos, en Los Ángeles había una muy buena que se llamaba La Banda Elástica. Otra revista que se llamaba Bomb, de Quique Posada, me acuerdo. Entonces él se dio la tarea de investigar, no sé de dónde, 
sacar así como que estaciones de radio en todo Estados Unidos que estaban transmitiendo el rock en español. Entonces, en ese tiempo en Chicago solamente estaba Radio Arte y, no, y yo. Entonces, se comunican con ellos, se comunican conmigo, entonces tenías que mandar por fax, no había ni email. Entonces tú ahí este, ponías lo que más tocabas. Algunas veces era mentira. Solamente querías verte muy bien que tocabas a todos tus muertos, cuando en realidad no tenías un CD de todos tus muertos. Pero, lo, pero tratabas de hacerlo lo más este, cercano a la realidad. Empieza así a correrse la voz, gente de, con publicaciones como CMJ, College Music Journal de Nueva York, que empiezan a tener una sección de rock en español dentro de su, de su revista. Entonces comunican contigo a través de cartas, o sea, ni siquiera email. Yo mandaba mi lista a CMJ, a Boom, de la banda elástica, y otra revista nueva que se llamaba Retila, porque ellos se comunicaron conmigo para pedirme que les mandara un ensayo, ¿no? Y hey, puedes hablar de la historia de rock en Chicago, que en realidad pues, yo no la conocía muy bien. O sea. Let's see if this works now. Allow in app purchases. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense where it would let me do the password in another section and not in this section. Wait, can I see if I'm real quick? We're live. Let me see if. Oh, we're live. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to figure this out. Hold on. Te digo, estaba en los suburbios. Lo único que sabía yo de la historia de Chicago era de, de las tocadas que hacía el Aragón o, no sé, Houghton Park o. El metro empezaba a ser tocadas de rock en español. Entonces de eso hablaba yo básicamente en esa publicación. Era de 12 de la noche a 4 de la mañana, entonces ¿quién me iba a acompañar en esa, en esa locura? ¿no? Pero aún así, de repente, hubo gente que me llamó a decirme quiero colaborar contigo, de ahí salió un colaborador, Super Kit. Era uno de mis radioescuchas, lo invité a una vez al programa, una vez se ganó boletos, fue a recoger sus boletos de algún toquín y ahí lo invité a que participara y, y ahí salió él a hacer su programa. Y de repente eso evolucionó y ya le dimos una hora a Super Kick, que su programa se llamaba Mascando Ska. Y estábamos en ese tiempo, él, yo, eh, Jesús, que te digo que estaba en Radio Arte, y otra chica que llegó de San Luis Potosí, Eloisa Rodarte, una chica que sí trabajaba a nivel profe profesional en las grandes ligas de la radio, donde sí ganaba ella dinero. En el departamento de promociones teníamos a Flash, toda una leyenda del rock and roll de Chicago. Entonces Flash tenía una novia que siempre llegaba a la estación con él. Y ahí ya la poníamos a hacer así como que comerciales o bocetadas. Este tren ya está caminando y si te bajas o te subes al tren, el tren va a seguir, ¿no? Y a Gabriel fue así como una, una cosa esporádica. De repente iba, de repente no. De hecho, de ahí salió un segmento de radio que se llamaba Ruido, precisamente, donde propusimos hacer una hora de rock en español, pero con el comentario en inglés. Hubo un momento que el edificio donde transmitíamos en el centro de la ciudad um, iba a ser demolido, entonces para convertirlo en lo que es ahora, que es una, una, un edificio grandísimo, entonces lo iban a demoler y la estación se tuvo que cambiar a Rogers Park, ahí por, por el lago Michigan, al norte de la ciudad. Entonces en alguna ocasión Rocío llegó ahí como invitada de alguien, entonces yo la escuché hablar y dije, ah, esta chica tiene buen, muy bonita voz, ¿no? Entonces ya la invité a acá a participar, no en un programa especial de ella, sino como parte de todo el, todo el show, como, una, como un co-host, exacto. Los eventos que había eran las mismas bandas de siempre, es por lo que yo empecé a hacer cosas, porque ya así como que ya estuvo, ¿no? 
Había bandas que venían a, a grabar a Los Ángeles o a Nueva York y de repente se contactaban contigo a través de la radio y les armo una tocada en un restaurante de chambos. ¿no? Y así fue cuando empecé. O sea, básicamente así como que, pues sí, no vamos a hacer cosas diferentes. Eh, y que las bandas sepan de antemano que no vamos a ganar dinero. De hecho, hasta lo poquito dinero que se invirtió en hacer esa tocada, pues yo lo voy a perder, pero no es tanto. No importa, pero hay que empezar a hacer esto. Y así fue. Entonces, mucho mejor o más gratificante hacer eventos de grupos que nunca han venido a Chicago. Cuando yo empecé a trabajar en el Congres, nuestra idea era de apostar de que existe el lugar, existe el venue, tenemos el dinero, tenemos el conocimiento. ¿Y quién salió beneficiado? Todo el público. ¿Por qué? Porque la mayoría de los shows eran gratis. La idea de hacer un festival, que ahora se llama Ruido Fest, surgió básicamente porque un empleado, como yo, del Teatro Congres, me sugirió la idea de hacer un festival callejero como lo es ahora Pilsen Fest o Mole de Mayo y cerrar en la... si la gente que sabe de Chicago conoce la calle Milwaukee, donde está actualmente el Teatro Congres, cerrar el trayecto de tres cuadras. Eran tres escenarios, uno de rock hippie, que le dicen jam, eh, uno de punk y uno de rock en español. Dos días, llovió los dos días. ¿Y cuál fue el escenario que fue más gente? El de rock en español. ¿Qué te parece si hacemos en, hace un festival? Él me lo dijo a mí, un americano. Entonces yo dije, ah, buena idea, ¿no? Pero ahí quedó en una plática de un bar, así de que lo vamos a hacer y que, ah, sí, sí, sí. Pero yo me obsesioné con eso y lo volví a llamar una, dos, tres veces, hasta que ya no me contestó las llamadas, hasta que un momento le dije, ¿sabes qué? Le mandé un email y le dije, si no, lo, si no se va a hacer esto contigo, lo voy a hacer yo solo. Y al otro día... O sea, él dijo, no voy a desaprovechar esto. Y... Pero no fue así instantáneo, fue de que no va a suceder este año, va a suceder el año que entra porque se toma tiempo. Porque si se toma tiempo hacer un festival, no es de que digas, ah, quiero hacer un festival y, y lo haces en uno, dos, tres meses. Eh, se toma más tiempo. Y vas a otro país y todo el mundo dice, qué bueno que estás haciendo eso. Y qué chingón, quiero ir a Chicago. Gente que yo no conozco me conoce a mí. O sea, yo quiero presentarme así como que... My business card. My name is Eduardo. I know who you are. Chicago, Ruido Fest. Todos, nos, todos saben de Ruido Fest. Todos. Everything's been uh, wonderful. You know, the weather didn't help on Friday, but still people showed up. And uh, yesterday was packed, so today we expect the same results. So we got Caipanas in the house, so it should be beautiful. This is the final product. All the work for all the year pays off today. So it feels good, you know? Like uh, compliments get and a good feedback of like, yeah, that was a good curated festival. And it's because, I mean, I got knowledge of what's new, what's coming up, what's, you know, up and coming. And obviously, you know, the classics. Yeah, obviously it's a business, but you need to have a heart for it. Because, you know, sometimes you don't book the things that you want to book uh, because there's not enough money. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, thankfully, uh, we do have a, a good budget to pretty much book whatever we want. It pays off, like, to finally, like, live off of music, which I was never, you know, trying to do that. I always had, like, two or three jobs. And music was not, you know, I was not living off of music, but now, thankfully, that's, uh, that's the case.
piensa que... No sé qué pensarán, que estoy lavando carros por ahí en algún carro o algo. ¿Cómo estás, mi papá? ¿Y tú? ¿Cómo estás? 